Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Reading Between the Lines, uh, a poetry workshop being jointly organized by IWE Online and Prakriti Foundation from Chennai. Uh, our guest for today is the well-known poet, novelist, journalist, anthologist, uh, Jerry Pinto. And welcome to all of you. And uh, to begin the inaugural session, may I invite our guest, Mr. Pinto, to the stage, if you could take your seat. And also the head of the Department of English, Dr. Murli Manohar. <laughs> to introduce the Department of English, may I please call upon Dr. Murli Manohar. Good morning to one and all. On behalf of the Department of English on my side, we would like to welcome Jerry Pinto, the modern Indian English poet who has been very kind to come over to our University as well as the Department of English to conduct this workshop, poetry workshop, reading between the lines. And there are also questions that have been raised. Why do we read? Why poetry? And in fact, we are very honored to be midst of uh, the famous poet. And these days, when we come across the research topics, very few people would take up poetry as the area of research. I am sure, as you have just seen, the poet who has been interacting with you all and trying to find out and making you all e at ease by asking by asking you to introduce yourself so he has already begun the you know workshop and i'm sure you will all benefit out of this workshop today and as you know the as he has already been introduced as a poet novelist translator and that reminds me of the two important works that he has translated from Dalit literature, Baluta and the other one is a, a uh, When I Hid My Caste and I from Marathi to English. In fact, these are very important works from Dalit literature and it's a very great contribution to Dalit literature by Pinto. I'm very honored to know about that. I did not know about this, but I just come to know. And looking at his, um, the background that he graduated from you know, liberal arts, uh, with liberal arts, and then went on to do his law degree. And now he is the very well-known uh, poet in Indian English. With these uh, few introductory remarks, I would like to congratulate the organizers, Professor Pramod K. Nair and Professor Anna Korean, who are conducting this not so much as part of IOE, but when the Prakriti Foundation approached us, when I circulated this to all colleagues, none of them was coming forward, but Pramod and Anna came forward to organize this, volunteered to organize this. I am very grateful to them. And when it comes to the departmental activities, there is no doubt that 
they are always in front to come forward to organize and bring laurels to the department by you know organizing many things as students you all know that and this particular project ioe project on indian writing in english is doing very well and the largest budget that they have been sanctioned and the activities are going on continuously and this is one of them so i would also not hesitate to say that the fact that we are in the world rankings it is because of some of the you know faculty members like professor narayan chandran pramod k nair whose research contribution is immense and of course in the past there have been many colleagues but now they have been doing you know continuous research publications and contributing to the departmental you know affairs and also the rankings and let me also uh, go back to the poet who has also been uh, uh been given many awards i would like to mention some of them the awards that he received from national film award the hindu literary prize crossword books award windham campbell literature prize and the highest that is sahitya academy award so there are many awards that he has received and among all this the novel that he has published m and the big whom is the uh main reason for the awards that he has received and uh with regard to the participants i have been told that 90 participants have registered from outside the university plus our own students and in fact when i was requested about the our own you know students especially my class i have a class from 11 to 1 and when the coordinators asked me to let the students participate i immediately said yes because i always believe that any seminar or workshop that is organized by the colleagues you know anything that is organized has to be passed on this benefit to the students i personally believe in that and i have always been doing that and i would continue to do that i also believe very strongly in that and with these uh, few introductory remarks i am sure the participants are going to benefit immensely about this workshop and i like to thank both the coordinators as well as the research scholars who are you know helping him as part of this ioe you know project and i also take this opportunity uh to welcome the guest once again and i wish you all the best for this thank you thank you sir for your kind words um, and let me tell you that this is being organized with the prakriti foundation but to introduce prakriti foundation we have jino who is a rep representative of the organization but then he'll be speaking to you after the workshop he has a lot to say he told me so we look forward to it and to introduce indian writing in english online which is the world's first open access academic resource for indian writing in english we have the co-principal investigator of the project dr pramod k nair professor of english as well as a unesco chair in vulnerability studies here at the department of english university of hyderabad so please uh thank you first to the prakriti foundation for giving us jerry pinto for the day uh thanks to murli for enabling this uh participants from our department our university as well as from those neighboring institutions who have 
generously traveled quite a bit as far as I can see. Um, colleagues like Shantan also from other institutions who have come here today. Above all to the speaker of the day, Jerry Pinto. Um, about IWE Online, as Atul said, this is the world's first open educational resource uh, for Indian writing in English. Uh, it has, I'll run off some numbers, which are always good to know. Uh, the university also likes to know. We, as of now, have 20 critical biographies, nine survey essays, 27 pieces of poetry, five pieces of fiction and nonfiction, two visual texts, 13 texts collected under Indian writers in English, uh, Indian writers writing on English, five reviews, 11 interviews, and 34 talks. Uh, we have roughly over 100 items already up on this. We, were, we launched the site last April, April 2022. Um, two niche segments are coming up, one on Northeast literature and one on the medical humanities. The first item on that has already gone up. Um, our project assistants, Atul and Minakshi, tell me that we have now over 600 YouTube subscribers and we have crossed 49,000 hits since it was launched. So this makes it one of the biggest resources available uh, in open access uh, mode. Um, the, for the, those who don't know about this information, by way of information, for those who know about it, it's like all classes and syllabi, it's a repetition. Uh, I know, um, it started because in our usual harebrained uh, fit of absence of mind, Anna and I were thinking of a, an anthology on Indian writing in English, except that no publisher in the world, including Norton, which didn't of course write back, was interested in shelling out money to buy uh, copyright permissions. So everybody said, fantastic idea, who will pay? So we said, you. I said, no, 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 we will not pay. So uh, they expected that uh, authors, publishers will give us materials for free because they cannot pay. So we contacted about five publishers over the last several years and nobody was willing. So when the Institution of Eminence Project was launched, also because we are, we greatly believe that educational resources should be made available for free for people to access from any part of the world. Um, we decided to make a bid for it. So this project emerges out of a sense that at some point Indian writing in English requires a presence which will be global, uh, not restrictive, and in terms of access available to one and all from any part of the world. Um, so that's how it begins. It actually, like I said, began as a, as a sense of an anthology making process. Uh, we are currently thinking of upgrading this into a journal. We'll be applying for an ISSN soon, which will make some considerable shift in the way uh, people perceive uh, this entire archive. There are things that uh, we have stumbled over. Getting permissions is principally the problem, as I'm sure Jerry also knows about uh, publishers, uh, not most notoriously, uh, I'm assuming there's no OUP representative here, but OUP is, is, is uh, one, so she absolutely refuses to, uh, you know, says, oh, oh, open access, no, 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 not a chance, done. So um, this has been some kind of a hindrance, but we are also very gratified that several people have volunteered to give us materials for free, uh, in some cases for payment, but... Sorry? Ah, that, that's why we call people like you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> Space is really not the problem. Um, uh, for example, we, we've put together the complete Chandra Bhaga. Uh, we have got the complete Vagartha, but we are not able to trace copyright permissions, uh, who owns it, etc. Et Those are the. Is probably best. Yeah, we, we, tried, we tried the uh, foundations and all that, yes, but yes. So, Ha, it is, it is. So those apart. But we are also gratified that uh, the events we have organized since April 2022 uh, have received such uh, responses from students here, research scholars, faculty, and uh, unstinted support of that kind is what keeps us going. It's been a lot of work, so even though uh, Anna will deliver the formal vote of thanks, we must thank the person who's uh, here and not here, that's Meenakshi Srihari, who, who does much of the correspondence and work on the uh, uh, website and its resources, designing it, uh, redesigning it, 
uh, explaining to uh, you know digital retards like Anna and me uh, what these things are and and why there should be more videos and, and things like that. Uh, most of it, we, we'll, you know, the kind of indulgent, ha ha ha, TK, we know, uh, we should do it, but uh, those kinds of things. Uh, and the other is, of course, Atul, who uh, also bears the brunt of a lot of the uh, uh, running around to do. Uh, as an academic resource, we think this is amazing, principally because uh, we are running it. Uh, but the other reason is because uh, the, process of peer review has been very rigorous. So there's nothing on the website which has not gone through at least four to five revisions before it has been accepted as fit for uh, publication. So which is why we think we should be think, uh, thinking in terms of a journal like quality at least. So the peer review mechanism has been uh, tough as many people will uh, testify to, but also because we have been very gratified in terms of reviewer responses. They have been very constructive in their advice to us. We are very grateful to the Department of English and the Institution of Eminence Project and uh, to the person who has uh, set the ball rolling, so to speak, with the English in India essays, Professor K. Narayana Chandran, um, whose work continues to define what English in India is and has been, uh, given the citations his work, his own work on English in India uh, receives for the advice which he gives us, uh, several of which uh, we find uh, impossible to implement. Uh, that goes without saying, if, if Chandran has advised you, you know how it will be. Uh, you know? But we are also gratified in terms of institutional support and all of those. But above all, like I said before, and it's worth reiterating um, to the students, the audiences that have come to us, we hope to see it uh, grow, maybe keep it running well beyond the tenure of the Institution of Feminist Project, which is somewhere around March 2024. Uh, and we hope to have more such events where feasible online and offline. Thank you all for coming and uh, welcome to the poetry session after this. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Mr. Pinto, for the generous offer of offering us your, uh, your archive. And may I also tell the audience that Mr. Pinto features on the website, and we had once sent you a questionnaire on Indian poetry in English, and you were kind enough to respond to our questions. <laughs> At the risk of repeating myself, uh, Mr. Pinto does not need introduction, but before that we have the principal investigator of Indian writing in English online, uh, Dr. Anna Kurian, who would deliver a formal vote of thanks. Hi. So everybody has been thanking everybody else. And Gino at the beginning told me the focus should be on Jerry Pinto. Why are we all talking? So I will try and keep this as short as possible. I, of course, any formal vote of thanks requires me to thank the university, the administration, from the VC downwards, everybody who has made it possible for us to do this. So thank you. I also would like to thank and staff, they are always very, very helpful for us. So a big round of applause, please, because they, they do everything and they set it up. We just have to wander in here and do whatever our staff is over here. So thank you very much. I would also like to thank the volunteers. We've had, as always, several people who volunteer for the things that we do. Today we have two new people, Debayan and Ananta from the MA, but also, of course, Arjun, Lakshmi, Manoj, Megha, and Noah. So thank you to all of you. I would like to thank the staff at Lakeview Guest House, Mr. Das's catering staff, which will feed us lunch. Always a good thing again. And finally, my department and our head. We also have several of our faculty members here. So thank you to all of you for coming. And thank you, of course, to Murli for being here and for speaking. I'm also very touched that Murli looked at what Jerry had done and highlighted what was important, because that was really lovely. Thank you so much. Finally, before I stop, I would like to thank, like Pramod said, no, Minakshi is the one missing person we are all missing, and she wanted very desperately to be a part of this, but she can't because she's working. So in absentia, I thank Minakshi, of course, without whom nothing would have happened. There would have been no IWE online. And Atul, who does 
so much work for us every day. Pramod, of course, always. My final thanks is to Gino. Please, Gino, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Thank you. So, Gino and Jerry, of course. Prakriti Foundation for making this possible because when that letter came and Gino said it looks like a Nigerian scam, you get a letter saying that we are bringing Jerry Pinto to you and you're like, please, this must be obviously a scam, which is what happened to us also. We looked at the letter and we're like, nah, no, no, nobody's doing this, right? Who gives you something for free? We don't pay anything to have him here. So we're like, no. And then you discover it is true. There are miracles, there are good fairies, there are all kinds of things which still work. Prakriti and Gino are one of them. Thank you so much, Jerry, for coming. Thank you, everybody. One last bit of formality before we begin the workshop. May I introduce the speaker? Again, an extremely redundant exercise because nobody here needs introduction to Jerry Pinto. I'm sure all of you have come armed with your favorite Pinto text, favorite Pinto books to get autographs and photographs. So he's. I'm sure he'll kindly oblige all of you, uh, his doting readers and, and admirers. So, uh, Jerry Pinto is a writer and poet based in Mumbai. His books include the novels M and the Big Home, which won the Hindu Prize and the Crossword Book Award, and Murder in Mahim, which won the Valley of Words Award and was shortlisted for the, for the Crossword Award. The non-fiction book Helen, The Life and Times of an H-Bomb, which won the National Award for the Best Book on Cinema, and two, two books of poetry, I Want a Poem and Other Poems, and Asylum. He is an acclaimed translator. He has published landmark translations from Marathi and Hindi. His books for children include A Bear for Felicia, When Crows Are White, and Tickle Me, Don't Tickle Me. His edited volumes include A Book of Light, When a Loved One Has a Different Mind, and Bombay Merijan, Writings on Mumbai, which he edited with Naresh Fernandez. His recent work includes The Education of Yuri, which is a novel, and the anthology Indian Christmas Essays, Memories, Hymns, which he co-edited with Madhulika Little. In 2016, Jerry Pinto received the Wyndham Campbell Prize and the Saitya Academy Award. May I now welcome our speaker for today, Mr. Jerry Pinto, please. Okay, uh, just because this was such a lovely thing to start by talking about, uh, you know, miracles and whatnot, I want to tell you the story of the Wyndham Campbell Award. It's completely out of, out of syllabus as they were, as you might say, but it's just such a lovely thing. So once upon a time, there was a gay couple called uh, Donald Campbell and Sandy uh, Wyndham, okay? And uh, one of them was a writer, one of them was an actor. And the actor was a beautiful young man, and he died young, and he left his partner shares in the family firm. And the partner was told when he received these shares, he was told, come on, you should sell some of them and you know, divide it up and buy other companies. And he said, no, this is a gift of love. I'm holding on to them. Cut to 40 years later, someone rings him up and says, you do know that your shares are now worth $24 billion. So he says, yeah, I do, but what am I going to do with it? I'm 85. But what I do know is that as a writer, what you need most of all is time. So I'd like to set up a prize that will give writers the time to do what they want. So let's just give them big chunks of money and let's just give them this money every year, $150,000 for three poets, three playwrights and three novelists across the world. Anyone writing. And then, and because it, this is a prize of such kindness, they don't even tell you you're in the running for it. Because otherwise there is a shortlist, right? And as soon as a shortlist comes out, you begin to read the shortlist and you begin to think, what rubbish is on the shortlist? I'm obviously going to get it. Or you think, oh my God, there he is on the shortlist and I'm not going to get it. Or whatever, right? They don't tell you the first thing you know is a phone call, which says, hi, I'm calling, and it sounds like a Nigerian scam. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm calling from the Wyndham Campbell Prizes, and you just won the Wyndham Campbell Prize this year. We only have one requirement, that you fly business class to America, and uh, give our students a talk. So, yeah, 
and where is this talk in yale okay so all my friends who went to america to study paid american universities to study there i got the american universities to fly me there and pay me which is the moral of the story anyway so i'm just thinking that was just one of those lovely things that happened in in the course of my life but what it also did was it freed me to do what i all had always wanted to do which was to translate because to translate in this country is a wonderful thing i believe it is really important i i believe it is fundamental actually to our democracy to understand each other to talk to each other because you see in india we have this habit of talking of ourselves as bilingual and trilingual and multilingual oh i speak uh, hindi and i speak telugu and i speak english and i speak and i speak all very well you do speak it no one's denying that but you use language like a public toilet all of us use languages to get our work done you use hindi generally to talk to the man who's driving your auto bhaiya wahan lena you use telugu or your mother tongue or your home language to talk to your grandparents that's who you to use it to you use english most of the time because english is your power language english english i always say is a god it's a very demanding god and like most indian gods it has several hands in one hand it has a huge pair of pliers red hot and it wants you to open your mouth and it will push the pliers in and tear out your mother tongue your home language but it's a god gods don't do these things just like that in the other hand it has a green card which it hands over to you le you gave up your mother tongue you gave up your language take your green card go language so central to the subcontinent so powerful and passionate are we about language or we used to be that international martyrs day is celebrated because of two bengali men who died to protect their language goa does not have rights we can't be bothered we have too much fun already we don't try it. then one day the maharashtra the government announced that the nash the state language would be changed not even the state language the union territory language would be changed to marathi go right it you don't play with my language and suddenly the goans were reminded that konkani little sister of all the languages little sister with acute retardation and i'll explain who retarded go konkani little sister with down syndrome she's written in five different scripts she's written in romi roman script she's written in nagari she's written in urdu she's written in kannada and she's written in malayalam yesterday i met a young woman konkani speaking woman from kochi who speaks konkani in kochi and writes there's a magazine in konkani we were suddenly reminded of this inheritance and what was that inheritance long ago the colonial powers arrived in india the first colonial power to arrive was the portuguese the last to go was the portuguese 1947 the rest of india celebrated independence the portuguese said we are not going it took them another 15 years 1961 the portuguese finally left But during that time, 
the portuguese were a little smarter than the british the british were seducible and they were seduced many of our bhashas have dictionaries that were first invented by the british the standard dictionary that is used today for marathi when i'm translating is still molesworth most sanskritologists may have moved from monier monier williams but he's still a, fa a fabulous dictionary the british for some reason thought indian languages were important mainly of course to write bibles so that they could convert everybody fair enough that was what they wanted to do we had the macaulay's macaulay's famous lines remember one shelf of of a good western library equals the entire output of the subcontinent so ho but in goa the portuguese understood one fundamental thing if you want to convert them you've got to get their culture to change and to get their culture to change you got to get them to change their cooking they made a fundamental change in goan cooking no salt in the rice was generally the rule which is why our curries are saltier the goans rome christians started putting salt in their rice but more importantly they banned konkani they banned konkani first in public places then they banned konkani in the home and we were told as children this story which i thought was like come on colonial mythology that there was a moment when a portuguese officer passing by the bedroom of a young mother who was nursing her newborn baby and singing a lullaby in konkani breaks into the room grabs the baby from her head and slams it against the wall kills it and i thought really who does that sort of thing two instances recorded in history to try deliberately to break the connection between the self and the culture you disrupt the connection with language english has done this to all of us it has disrupted the connection with our mother tongues so i would say to you if you want to re reestablish some connect with who you are choose now because these are choices they cannot be mandated i am an evangelist you can tell for your bhasha for your home language but i can't make you do this i can't make you go back to reading in a language other than english also i can't make you do it i can suggest it i can tell you a fable once upon a time there was a land called monolingua monolingua was a nice country it was pastel colored pink blue yellow nothing was wrong with it except the monolinguals had this feeling somewhere that something was missing in their world and so they went up to their oracle the old woman who lived on a hill and they said to her you know something's missing in our world what do you think it is and she said well very simple across the river there is that land called multilingua and it has salt go bring back salt from multilingua and use it in everyday cooking and your life will be different you'll see what the improvement is so the people who went up said but but 
you know, multilingual is across that terrible, dangerous river called the river of meaning. How are we supposed to get across? The oracle said, you know, I told you what I think you should do. It's not my job to figure out how you do it. You go do it. Okay? So then one young woman said, okay, I'll go. I'll go. And she made a boat. She pushed the boat out into, this, into the river of meaning. And she crossed across to the other side. It was difficult, but she got there. Then the multilingual said, where have you been? We were waiting for you. You want salt, right? So she said, gosh, I brought money. How much can I pay? She, they said, we don't take money. Our salt is free. She said, okay, load up the boat then. And they said, I'm really sorry. We just have one small, well, we have a requirement. Our requirement is that you can take as much salt as you want. We got no issues. You can take it free. But you must build your boat, your boat off that salt. And you must take it across as a boat. No putting any in your pockets. No putting any in, in a bag, in a sack. She said, but you know, as soon as I put my boat into the river of meaning, it will dissolve. And they said, yeah, sorry, we know that. But that's how it's going to be if you don't mind. Or otherwise we shoot you dead. So she made a boat. And as she put it into the, into the river of meaning, little thirsty tongues of water began to lick at, the, at her boat. Plop, plop, plop. And then she took the boat into the perilous sea of local dialect. That small area which is almost like a whirlpool. And then there was the reef of idiom that came in the way. That threatened to wreck her boat. And came the rapids of humor. Always the most difficult to translate. But worst of all, worst of all, the cyclone of poetry hit her. Hit her boat. So that when she arrived on the other side, all she had was a handful of salt. And people said, this is all you brought? And she said, yes, but I'll go again. That's, and therefore, she began to be known as a trans-salter, a cross-salt. And as things happen in etymology, the letters got in, inverted and she began to be known as a translator. Across the river of meaning, bringing the salt of multilinguality into the boring everydayness of monolinguality, losing most of the meaning, lost in the river of meaning. But that river of meaning runs past both monolingua and multilingua. So slowly, even the salt that she lost is penetrating into the subterranean lands of monolingua and infecting it. That's my fable for translation. That's why I translate. Because in India, we live on linguistic islands. These islands, at low tide, you can walk across. Yeah? But you rush back to the island on which you live before the tide rises. You never really explore the other island. To explore the other island is to treat that literature as a that language, that island, as a pilgrimage spot. You have come in humility. You have come with thirst. You have come with desire for refreshment. You have come understanding that there is a secret here, a Newman, and you will take that Newman back with you. And it will elude you. It will illuminate you and elude you again. But if you do not go to the other language with the spirit of a pilgrim rather than the spirit of a tourist, 
or the spirit of a, a colonizer, you will come back empty-handed. To do that, therefore, you investigate, you encounter, you make connection with the most precious form of language that we know in any language. Every language's most precious secrets are held in its poetry. Always. The first original poems were written literally as talismans against the unknown. It was terror that made us sing poems aloud. Terror of lightning, terror of rain, terror of wild animals, terror of elephants, terror. So we spoke words because we knew words were magic. There was a strange magic in naming because the name then holds, the name then contains, the name begins the process of understanding. To name is to understand, which explains the British's terrible desire for taxonomy, which explains the 18th century Carolus Linnaeus looking at the magnificent, wonderful wildness of nature and wanting to break it down, break it down, break it down, separate, 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 tell me, what are you, trisolate, are you vertebrate, are you invertebrate, are you monocotyledonous, are you dicotyledonous, what are you, tell me. Because when order is established, we rule through language. But poetry is disorder. Poetry takes order and says, what did you think? What did you think? Is it going to be that simple? So, my favorite example, Yeats. Yeats falls in love. Wild Irish rebel Yeats falls in love. He falls in love with Maud Gone. Maud Gone, we know very little about except that she was a revolutionary, so she must have been hot stuff. She was six feet tall and she had red hair. That's enough. For us, traces are enough to build a person, right? And here's Yeats in love with her. And Yeats writes, Ed wishes for the clots of heaven. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with silver and golden light, the blue and the dim and the dark cloths of night and light and the half light, I should spread those cloths beneath your feet. But I, being poor, have only my dreams. I have spread these dreams beneath your feet. Tread carefully. For you tread on my dreams. What did Maud Gone do, the mad bitch? She said, no. She came and trampled on his dreams and walked off. But this is Yeats you said no to. And so he wrote a poem out of his rage. When you are old and grey and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and think of the look my eyes once had. So many loved your moments of fair grace, but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. Yeats tells us from 150 years ago, it's not going to be easy, this love-shove business. It's not very Ritu or Rani ka Raja ki beti ki aulad ke putra ka suputra ka shadi. It's going to be terrifying. But two things will walk with you. Time and poetry. Poetry will allow you the offer of seduction. Romeo and Juliet, anybody? Everybody knows Romeo and Juliet, right? You know the names at least. Like, Budona Marte and Sale, they both die in the end. That's the, that's the basic idea, right? But what we forget is that at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, Romeo is not in love with Juliet. Romeo is in love with Rosalind. He's so in love with Rosalind, he's telling his buddy, come, come, yeah, I, I gotta go see her. I just, I, I just have to see her. I just have to see her. You come with me, I gotta see her. 
And the other guy is saying, boss, we'll both get killed, okay? We're going to get killed. These guys are mad. They hate your family, right? We're going to get killed. I don't care, you come with me. And he come. friend comes. Romeo. Romeo. 14 years old. <laughs> Romeo walks into that party and sees Juliet. And Rosalind's gone. Wipe out Rosalind, Juliet. But this is Romeo. He's not going to earn his name for nothing. So there's that scene under the balcony. Oh, hark, what light on yonder window breaks. Tis the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun. And vanquish yonder moon. Naturally, Juliet falls in love. <laughs> Naturally. I think she's already in love because she's come out and she's saying, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? And wherefore does not mean where are you, kidar hai tu? It means why are you Romeo? Okay? In the middle of this, we are suddenly told, Romeo's 14, that surprised you? Juliet's 14 too. Juliet's 14. And how do we know this? From the text. Because Juliet, okay, is about to get into an arranged marriage. Her parents want her to marry someone who's correct for her. And she says, nah, nahi karna. Nani, nahi karni shadi. Sounds familiar? <laughs> Not changed much. Okay. And her mother says, Beta, maids thy age were mother's maid. What's that mean? Maids, M-A-I-D-S, thy age were mother's M-A-D-E. Lovely, there's a pun there already. Beautifully done. Elegantly done. Effortless Shakespearean. Maids, thy age were mother's maid, meaning your age ki ladkiya have had, got married and had children already. What are you doing sitting here, ya? Yeah? And our mother's trying to explain because that's what mothers do. When the father bursts into the room and tat, tat, slaps her. And then he says, 14 years I have fed you and looked after you. 14 years, count. <laughs> Not that, but that's the essence of the line. Yeah? And you don't want to get married? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Because the body had signaled She's ready for marriage. She's ready for procreation. She's ready for childbirth. Because she's menstruating. The invention of adolescence is a 20th century phenomenon. Caesar Borgia killed his first man at the age of 13. His mother thought he was a late bloomer. Alexander the Great was 13 when he rode into battle the first time, risking his life. Because all this happened, because of a bizarre moment in the understanding of the body. In England, around the same time that Romeo and Juliet of course, Romeo and Juliet is a story that comes to us from Verona. It is a story that Shakespeare pinched. It wasn't his story in the first place. He got it out of a, a series of books, a series, Merchant of Venice, all that were in the same uh, tales of, of Italy. He got this from there. But in the 16th century, just imagine if Shakespeare had a toothache. What would they have done to Shakespeare? He would have gone to the local. Who do you think he'd have gone to? If you have a toothache, where do you go? I go to the dentist. You go to the dentist because there are dentists. He went to the barber. All of medicine was handled by barbers. Because they used knives to shave you. Logically, they could use the knife to cut you and take out your tumor. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly why. In Britain, you will still see that barbers have poles with red and white circling patterns. That was to represent the blood on bandages. Because they were bandaging people. The barbers were the doctors. There was no doctory. But there was an apothecary's handbook which gave you recipes and remedies for 
ordinary problems like having a toothache. One of those required you, if you had a toothache, to collect bat droppings in the full moon and mix with momia. Now what is momia? If anyone is squeamish, take out your vomit bags while I explain what momia is. When a mummy is prepared, one of the places where it is punctured to drain fluids is at the base of the skull, here. After that, they are wrapped in linen and preserved for a few 900,000 years and then they are dug out suddenly by mistake. Those bandages would be unwrapped and the cerebrospinal fluid that had accumulated on the bandages would be scraped off and sold as spices in 16th century England. It was a spice, you put some momia on your pie and it was a herb if you needed a little toothache. So obviously a tooth is ill, it's a bit swollen, you rub some bat shit on it, you rub some momia on it, you're going to die. You're going to die of a toothache. Because the other alternative was take the blood out of your body. How did George Washington die? Of a bad throat. You have medical humanities, so I got inspired by that side. George Washington had a sore throat from shouting orders on the battlefield. And so his, uh, his surgeons, there were four doctors in attendance, thought the best way to cure him would be to take out his blood. So they drained about 10 liters of blood from him and he died of not having any blood. Because he had a throat, he had a pain in his throat. Yeah. Yeah. So, we now understand germ theory, we understand bacillus, we understand virus, we understand corona, we understand, some of us understand vaccination, we live longer, we are healthier. So we decided to give you guys a break. We said, okay, so she's menstruating. Okay, so he can produce spermatozoa. No issues, still. We'll cut away five years of their time and we'll send them to college and university. We will pretend, as a human species, we will pretend that they are supposed to be studying English literature or physics or philosophy or history. But if Nikhil, over there, right? Or Kriti Sundar over there, right? Yeah, still working. Okay. Uh, if Nikhil or Kriti Sundar does not, if Nikhil does not study Nikhil for five years, then there's no point getting a degree. You are here in this moment not to understand what a Zyuguma is which is a figure of speech. You are here to understand who you are. Everything, whether you're studying philosophy or you are studying French, is only the cherry on the cake. The rest of it is time for you to figure out who you are. And now here's the terrible thing. We decided somewhere that most of us would be mediocre. Just like that. Why not? You've heard of the sine curve, no? The sine curve is like if you take a whole bunch of people, like all of you, okay? 10% of you are going to be outstanding. So that's 10% here, at the small end of the curve. Can I draw this on your book? Yeah? You can sell it as an artwork later. And you can hold the mic. Yeah. So this is the sine curve. Hmm? Yeah. 
So 10% of you are going to be outrageously brilliant. And 10% of you are going to be complete lunatics. Like just, oh, who hired this guy? Can someone take him out and kill him quietly, please? I would advise you not to say this. There are Chatu people who might do it. This happened in murder in the cathedral, right? Will no one rid me of this troublesome priest? No, turbulent. Will no one rid me of this turbulent priest, says Henry VIII, and his knights in armor go and stab that turbulent priest in the cathedral, giving T.S. Eliot the opportunity to write a brilliant play. Nothing happens for bad, everything happens for good only. <laughs> okay, so here and this is all of us, the vast majority are ordinary and mediocre. So mean. That like should could be arranged better, but that's how it is. So I'm going to break this down for you and show you how to get into the top 10%. Okay. And now you're going to think he's going to see, he's going to say poetry. Read poetry, then you'll become brilliant. <laughs> Actually, you'll become brilliant at understanding the self, which is not a bad thing. You'll become, underst you'll become better at understanding other people, not a bad thing. Poetry is an exercise in empathy, not a bad thing. Poetry is an exercise in standing in another person's shoes, not a bad thing. Poetry is about recognizing that the end of the world can happen in two ways. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if the world should perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is great and will suffice. That poem is a whole bunch of terrifying onomatopoeias. Fire! Shh! Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire. Desire speak like that. I hold with those who favor fire. But if the world should perish twice, I think I know enough of hate, tuck, tuck, to think that for destruction, ice is great, tuck, tuck, great, tuck, 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 and will suffice. It's a map of music, of how you can deploy music to talk about the end of the world. The end of the world, the revelation state, and if you have, how many Christians here? No one? Are you very good. Excellent. This is such... Okay, one person. Very nice. Uh, I can sort of guarantee that the two Christians here have not read the Bible. Uh, but where is she? Yeah, she's not come. She has read the Bible. Oh, she's there. Okay. Uh, because if you ever should happen upon a copy of the New Testament, and if you're a druggie, <laughs> please read the book of Revelations. It is outrage. I mean, what was John taking? You want to know. Like, boy, dude, seriously, just read this shit. And then the beast will come. And the beast has four faces. And the five pearls. And the gates. And the fire. And oh. So poetry can do all that for you. That's, that's important and it's relevant and it's important. But here's the secret. The secret of getting into that top 10% that I was talking about. The secret. Now, okay. Let me say something about teaching methods. There are two dharmas of teaching. There is lake dharma and there is tap dharma. So what is lake dharma? Lake dharma is a library. Now, you all are members of reputed universities and, life and colleges, no? Very reputed, no? Getting grade A++ in NAC because they are taking NAC people out for good dinner. <laughs> then NAC is giving them A++. If you take NAC out for bad dinner, then you get B- and shut up. Yeah? This is how it works. So, if you should ever be in charge of the NAC, 
You don't bother about like all that stuff. You bother about where dinner is happening. <laughs> and preferably with what they call a little rasranjan. Yeah? But that must not be on the bill. It must be someone else pays that bill for the alcohol. Right? Okay. So Lake Dharma is the library in your college, your institution, your university, which you, with deep commitment, ignore. Unless this library is equipped with nooks, where you can sit with the beloved and rub knees. Rub, 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 rub knees. While talking in hushed whispers of where were you yesterday, what were you doing, you talked to her, I saw you or whatever, you talked to him, I saw you, etc, etc, etc. See, see, someone's already pointing to the library squatter. <laughs> and he is looking daggers at you. He has to find a new place. So the uh, lake may have beautiful, clean water. But it will never, a lake will never get up and walk to you and pour itself into your mouth. You are going to have to go to the lake. Tap dharma is on the other hand, how the university system is organized, no offense to university teachers. May I use your head? Oh, I used your book, no? so I'll use, no. May I use your head? No, some male head so that there'll be no questions. May I use your head as a demonstration device? Okay. So here is tap dharma. I look at a student and I think, nice head. I open, no, no, you keep your face that way. I turn your head like that, I open it, and I put it down. Now your brain is nicely exposed, and I turn on the tap. Water falls in. Then I look, is there enough? I shake. That sound, you remember? Huh. And then I take the thing and I close it. Then I hold the nose. Holding the nose period is exam time. When you have held the nose long enough, the mouth opens wide. Open wide. And vomit happens. <laughs> now if the vomit spreads over seven or eight pages of A4 sized full scap, I will give you 62%. If you do eight, five pages, I will give you 54%. If you do three pages, I'll say get, let him go with a degree 35% pass class go. I will give you, but don't write less than that. Huh? Okay, got it now? But here's the thing, the average Indian student is a wild animal in search of notes. <laughs> so the phone calls start about two weeks before the exam. Hey, you got notes on Chomsky? <laughs> hey, you got notes on, on Renaissance literature? What is the Renaissance? So many letters. <laughs> so we'll call it Renault literature. Hey, you got Renault, yeah? Whatever. That's the shit you do, right? Now, what is that? That is, you are in search of someone else's vomit. <laughs> so, you will go looking for someone who vomited what they heard onto paper. Once you have secured these notes, you will ignore them. Because you got the notes, na? Now, what do you have to do? Then the day before the exam, you will call up like a friend who is slightly better and more responsible than you and say, hey, short me bowl na. <laughs> like, ye kya hai renaissance quickly. Or, yeah, there was one middle ages now and after that they all became nice and bright and renaissance happened. Renaissance means rebirth, Re write that five times. So you start when you're writing your exam. The renaissance period happened in Europe. It was a period in Europe. <laughs> this period happened in Europe. It was a European period, but only four lines. I may have to move on. Then you think, okay, Europe is a continent. It is a continent with many countries. They all did Renaissance at the same time. Maybe it went viral. Was it a me? What are you writing that Miss Korean doesn't even know what viral means? Cut it out. Okay, then um, a Renaissance means rebirth. So everyone was being reborn, like that only, like, oh, something, like they borrowed it from India, because we get reborn. We only invented rebirth. Renaissance is an Indian phenomenon. 
exclamation mark now there i dare you not to give me a first class i will come okay that's you guys and now imagine your teachers they are looking at this and thinking was it for this the clay grew tall oh what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth sleep at all and then they had the end think okay but if i fail this fuck he'll come back and i'll have to read this again no on and out baby shoes 50 on 100 and may you never may i never see you again except of course the teachers dharma is to see only those ones again hi miss how are you miss you say hello how are you miss you remember me miss i vomited in your class twice and you said do you all spend all your life drinking <laughs> miss now i spend only weekends drinking you'll be happy no that's what teachers go through <laughs> you can understand why there's a slightly worn look after some years so suppose you wanted to actually elude this right you wanted to elude this whole system and suppose you actually were aiming for excellence now if i were a lake dharma teacher i would tell you that the answer to excellence has been decoded by the americans by a writer called malcolm gladwell who wrote a book called the outliers now everyone should make a note outliers by malcolm gladwell this will join the number of notes that make no sense to you after a week because you will think outliers by malcolm gladwell means what why did i write this down because there's nothing around it there's one beautiful star which you have doodled and you put then you decided oh this doesn't look balanced on this side so i'll do a star on that side also very nice and now i'll do a lady's face with a big eye meenakshi and then i'll give lovely eyelashes oh what's he saying ha ha something about excellence something like that no? anyway and since if i were a lake dharma teacher i'd leave it at that and allow you to go and find out what malcolm gladwell said yourselves but i have been a teacher since the age of 15 when i started teaching mathematics and i have taught till this year you don't fool me i know you i completely know you you will go and even see malcolm gladwell on the sunday market he'll be there and you'll think ah ha ah. he said na we should buy he said we should read na that fellow that funny are this is nice sir centipede here see that cute na is probably getting more from this than you are <laughs> centipede is thinking i am aiming for excellence <laughs> i will be an excellent centipede how i will walk okay live centipede i'm sending you meta uh okay so but since i know that you will then you'll pick up the book and this is the general attitude can i have your book two books oh god so many pages what yeah can't write short or what like rupee core Four four lines on one page and you're done, na? Seriously? Outliers and all, na? Ha, maybe next time. Boy, how much is it? Ah, fifty rupees. Fifty rupees. Please, I can get jeggings. And jeggings are more important than excellence. We all know. This is like, you know, fundamental. So I'll tell you the secret. He says that the answer to extraordinary excellence. is very simple it's two words now you can take it down two words yay 10000 hours you want to be a dancer dance for 10000 hours you want to be a writer write for 10000 hours you want to be a singer do riyaz for 10000 hours you want to play a musical instrument do that for 10000 hours at the end of 10000 hours you will be extraordinary you'll be in the top 
five percentile of anybody practicing that art or skill. So simple. But now break it down. Ten thousand hours is a time requirement out of us, right? So suppose you were to do two hours every day of dance because you want to be a dancer. How many years would it take you? You can use your phone and look at the calculator. Humanity students say itni ummeed thodi hai that they will do this as a mental like maths test. Ah, look at a calculator. Pick up. You did the correct sum. At least you're that one step forward. Ah, froze. Nahi karna. You don't want to find out how long it will take you to get to excellence. Sorry. Huh? Thirteen years. How old are you going to be after thirteen years? Let's say you're eighteen. You're going to be thirty-one. You're going to wait thirteen years before you write your first poem in public. No. So therefore, most of us choose mediocrity. We are aided in this by social media. Because if I want to write a poem now, I need to wait 13 minutes. I don't need to wait 13 minutes before it's on the net, and I've got 32 likes or 32 hearts on Instagram. I then hit the hearts to see who hit who liked my poem, because then I will like their poems. And see, she didn't like my poem. Then I'm not liking hers next time. Go, see. Serves you right. I have nothing against Instagram or social media. Okay, it keeps you occupied. It keeps you entertained. It keeps you out of my hair generally. If I were your parent, I'd give you five phones and say, "Knock yourself out, babe. Go for it. Do as much social media as you want. Why do I care?" because eventually we all become competitors for our parents we all compete for the same jobs we all compete for the same space you write your poems and you write shit poems because you've not prepared you've not thought you've not worked at your craft you haven't bought a book of poetry in your life You haven't even gone to the library and issued two books of poetry, but you want to write poetry. So you're not going to be competition for me. I'm very happy to watch you on your phone, cat video, a <laughs> sweet like, cat video, da 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 like. <laughs> Spend your life watching cat videos, babes. I'm perfectly happy. No competition. When I die, I'll feel really sorry. Like I'm close to death, I'll think, "Oh my God, poor things." They just—I have seen a whole generation of the finest minds <laughs> losing themselves in pixels, preferring pixels to people, which is what you do. We prefer pixels to people. Pornography teaches us an a-peopled sexuality. It peels away. humanity it peels away complexity it peels away the amount you will learn from interaction with another human being and offers you a dopamine hit what is that dopamine hit well there are two things that come out in your brain one is serotonin and one is dopamine dopamine is the same place as cocaine and sugar so it's addictive and you want it again and again you just have to keep and the same thing for cat videos by the way dopamine shots keep coming out that's what why reels instagram tiktok are so popular because dopamine shots are keeping keeping on coming and you get so addicted to dopamine that actually you die kids in china die and so now if you are on tiktok in china for 4 hours the government turns it off just gets into your phone and stops you from doing tiktok otherwise you might die there we don't have such controls they are coming i'm sure cuz like you know 
Have you noticed? We like control. Yeah. Poetry is therefore always suspect. Because it refuses control. And this is why the definition of poetry is such a difficult and complex thing. Because as soon as you settle down to define poetry, to say, well, but what is poetry? A very real poem turns up, which breaks that rule. And you've got to change the rule again. Or you've got to say, this is not a poem. And then you get just end up looking like a stupid idiot. Right? So why do we read poetry? We read poetry because we are human. We read poetry because being human is not a given. It's not something that you just get born, you know, with 26 chromosomes, with recognizably two arms and two legs and a well-developed cerebellum, which means you can think. It means you, you're a work in progress. You're working on becoming human with each choice that you make. And the choice to investigate what poetry can do to that humanity is a choice that will take you out on a limb. Poems, poets are always balanced if you are contemplating a life in letters, you're contemplating being a writer, I would advise you not to be a poet. Poets have the highest suicide rate of all writers. Novelists are the least. So I'm hedging my bets, I'm poet and novelist. <laughs> okay? It's because poetry is also, even if you're writing a poem about uh, daffodils, you're telling the reader something about yourself. Therefore, the first time that you read out a poem, it's nightmarish. Because you feel like you're standing up naked in front of people. It's just awful. It gets a little better, but each time there is a little shock to the system. And most poets don't bother about other things like, you know, sleeping well, and doing yoga in the morning, and going for morning walk, and having a dog and having good friendships, etc., etc., they kill themselves. On which happy note, I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to say, do you have any questions? If you don't have questions, then I'm happy to go away and look at a bookshop, where I will get my dopamine fix <laughs> by buying more books, which I do not need. Shall I say, anyone with a question, any kind of question? It's an AMA right now. Okay. Uh, another, another little success tip in life, right? When you go to a, an e, okay, when you go to any lecture, go with two questions prepared. In advance. It's a differentiator. It's a way of making yourself look intelligent to the person in charge. So if you have the question, your hand goes up immediately, they think, ah, oh, intelligent person. Just a hip. I was such an awful teacher, such a tap dharma teacher, that if, say, Anna Korean was coming to my department to, teach, to give a lecture, I'd call all my students into a room and say, Anna Korean is coming, you don't fuck this up, please. So all of you sit down and write a question for Miss Korean now and show it to me. Okay, and then there's a water you don't know. I say, Google her, idiots! And I'm Googling and say, Miss Kurian did her PhD in transnational polyphilology. Means what? Google that idiot! And then the clever ones will say, uh, ask, Jerry, is this an okay question? Uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Kurian, what is the state of transnational polyphilology now? And I say, good on you, babes. That'll keep her going for 10 minutes. <laughs> It's a good question. Oh. Good question. No one's reading poetry. Okay? If I asked you, how many of you read poetry? How many of you write poetry? Many hands would go up. If I say, how many read poetry? Very few hands would go up. Fewer hands would go up. Because, because the, the figures tell you this. Right? 
Asylum and Other Poems came out 25 years ago. It sold 1,000 copies. It's just come out again now in a fresh new edition of 1,000 copies. Anyone says, I read lots of poetry, I'm not, I'm not impressed. I don't think people buy poetry anymore. So if you want a book of poetry out, ask yourself, have you bought enough poet, books of poetry to say, I'm part of this ecosystem, boss. I'm supporting Indian poets in English because I'm, or in Telugu or whatever language you write in, because I'm part of that ecosystem and one day I hope they buy my books. We don't. We expect other people to buy our books. We don't buy books ourselves. Right? So no, there is no poetry happening. No poetry publishing happening except from small presses. But the number of people writing poetry is still the same. In fact, many more are writing poetry. I get about two books of poetry every week. People are either asking me to blurb it, or to review it, or to just respond to it if you have time, when you have time, whatever. I try because I've been treated with great, great kindness and gentleness by the poets whom I knew. Okay, so I try very hard to be uh, to look at every book that I get with care and to respond if it is, uh, if it is, and to respond with as much honesty I, as I can, knowing that the person is probably in a vulnerable place. Okay, so I try, but I will never tell the truth, I will never write back, this is pure shit, why do you bother? Okay, but if you read carefully, you'll probably see that. Most people don't read carefully. Yes, young man, the one who writes poetry and who reads poetry, yeah. I think you need to say it on the mic if you have to film it, then we need to ask for speaker. While writing poetry, it, uh, I find it toughest uh, while uh, going on the second stanza. And then this, there is this question of how to structure a poem. Should I go first write a plot about it or just start it? And the hardest thing is where to end. Uh, so the first thing is if sometimes, this is not, this is a rule of thumb. If sometimes the second stanza will not come, it may mean there is no second stanza. That is your poem. Right? Now, if it is a narrative poem that you started out, telling a story, and uh, therefore you will need more than one stanza to tell a story, then you need to ask yourself, is this a technical question that I'm facing, or is it a narrative question? A technical question is, my our story is set in uh, Tiruvananthapuram. I can't get anything to rhyme with Tiruvananthapuram. I don't, Tiruvananthapuram is like the whole line. How do I fit it in? Yeah, it, that's, that's one level, just one ordinary level of dealing with stuff is that when you are writing in English, you are writing in a language that is intensely metrical, that has very clear rhythm patterns, and Indian languages, which often interrupt and want to come in, are not like that. So your meter is now, your music is being disrupted by a non-metrical word in the middle of the, of the thing. So then, is it possible, sorry, that you need to disrupt your metricality? Is it possible that you should probably write even this narrative poem in the form of free verse? So those are technical decisions that you've got to take. The narrative problem may, be, may simply be, this is not a story that, I, that can be told in this form. Maybe I need to write this in prose. So in that sense, in that moment, if you can write anything in prose, ain't no poem, babe. It's not a poem if it can be written in prose. So, I hope that answers the plotting of it, because the plotting would be prose. If you're saying plotting is just like putting down a whole series of, of images and ideas and things that I'd like to have in, sure, that's fine. But if you can write it in prose, in no problem. Third thing, as far as the end of the poem goes, um, we are so lucky to be living in this day and age when a poem does not necessarily have to fit old Aristotle to have a beginning, a middle and an end. 
It's a slice of life. Where does a slice of a cake end? Where does it begin? It ends when you've finished eating it. Your poem, here's a story for you. And it is, again, a Zenish sort of story. So I don't know if it'll be useful. But if your cup is too full, then can I fill it? Another Zen story. So, Philip Guston, a poet, a, French, a painter of French origin, and uh, uh, was in, being interviewed on American television. And he said, and someone asked him about influences or something. And he says, when I begin the painting, everyone is in the room with me. The great painters are there, Leonardo da Vinci and Piero della Francesca and you know, and the contemporaries are there with me. Picasso is there and Hodgkins is there and you know, uh, the Koenig is there, they're all in the room with me. And my gallerists are in the room with me, the buyers are in the room with me, the family is in the room with me, my friends are in the room with me, the general public, they are all in the room and then I start painting. And as I begin to paint, one by one they leave the room until I am alone with my painting and then I must leave the room. Which I thought was a very beautiful thing when I heard it, but I was 21 when I heard it. Having lived several decades since then, I have decided that there is one more step here, Philip, Gustin Sahab. That wasn't a painting on the wall, what you finished and left behind. It is a painting when someone, when Jerry Pinto or someone like that walks into the room, looks at the painting and thinks, wow, there's something going on here. There's something that's speaking to me. Something I feel. This is a painting. Now the loop is complete. And therefore, one way of constructing a solution to many of the problems that you're facing, young, what is your name? Sagar. One of the pro solutions to this problem is form a poetry circle. We did this in Bombay in the 1980s. Uh, many of the poets who were there are now very fine poets. Me, I was one of them, not I'm saying that I'm fine. Ranjit Horskote was there, Arundhati Subramaniam was there, Menaka Shivdasani was there, Anju Makhija, Prabhanjan Mishra, T.R. Joy, uh, Eunice, no, not Eunice, Marilyn Narona. All of us met and we met, uh, in the beginning we met every Saturday. Later we met every fortnight, then we met every month and then it closed down. But during those two hours on the Saturday, Poetry was front and center. You brought a poem and you brought copies. In those days, Xerox wasn't so cheap, so we rewrote the poem ten times. But what an experience that was! By the eighth time that you were rewriting the same poem, you wanted to change it. Physically, you thought, no, obviously this is not working, I need to do this. So then all those first eight would have to go, you'd start a new. It was fabulous. Then at the reading, you got, you got to read one poem or two poems. There was a moment of silence, a mandated one minute of silence, for complete silence, while this poem was absorbed. And then people gave you feedback. The feedback was very clear. There was a rule that said, and we reminded each other of the rule, it is your poem, not my poem. This is feedback. You can choose to take it or you can choose to ignore it. But you're actually test driving the poem in the middle of people who value poetry, who think poetry means something and is important. So it was precious. It was a lovely space. And then it died because precious, lovely spaces have a habit of dying. That's not an issue. Right? But a young person at one of the last readings came up to me. She was at the university at the time. And she said, uh, can we take over Poetry Circle? Can I do Poetry Circle somewhere else? And I said, of course you can. Please do, because it's just a model. It's a free open source model. Go away, take it away. And I told her the rules, you know, bring copies, everybody sits around, everybody listens to the poem, everybody gives feedback, etc., etc., etc. Maybe you could have a deep focus from time to time, once every six weeks or so, or two months or three months or so. If someone has 20 poems, then he's the, or she is the only person, or they are the only person who's reading the, uh, the poem that 
poems that day. Everybody's attention is only on that person. We also have guest readings when a poet is out from out of town comes. They often want to meet poets, so they get to meet poets in this uh, young poets here. They, so we had, we had British poets, we had Israeli poets, we had French poets, we had German poets all come to visit us because they hadn't heard of something like this. It was amazing. Okay, um, so I said, please do it, right? And at some point, I'll also come and read a poem, no? because I'm missing, I'll miss poetry circle. So she said, yeah, 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 I'll tell you when it's come. And about six months later, I met her and I said, how's the poet, your poetry circle going? And she said, closed down after the first session. So I said, what happened? She said, yeah, you know, we, uh, the first person read his poem, we gave feedback, then he left. And so the second person feedback and left. So eventually there was me and this one person who said, only you are left and I'm going to read, everybody else got feedback from me, I'm not doing this, and he walked out. And I never got to read my poems. So this is one of the things that, that social media is doing to you. It is making you unprepared for listening, which is a de-selfing activity. It is unselfing the self when you become just someone who listens. You open yourself. You listen with full intensity. You are present there. You are intensely present in that moment for that person and that person's poem. And then it becomes a lovely space of sharing <coughs> and a protected space. People came out in the 1980s in poetry circles. Because you could write a poem about being gay or being uh, trans or being anything and it was treated as a poem. So you had that liberation of being able to say it and to step away from it if it was too dangerous. It was wonderful. <coughs> it was a great time. But you need a community. I cannot give you an answer to a question that is specific to the poem itself. When a poem itself is, a, is alive on the page, when you're making and breathing life into the poem, I can with you sit and look at that poem and help, but I can't give you a formulaic answer that will say, this is how poems end, or this is how you get to the second stanza, because that's not the way poetry works. Anyone who gives you a workshop with tools like that is a fool, and you are a fool for being in that workshop, right? Uh, someone, you had a question. So I'm from Kelts. Um We deal with translating poems from English into our mother tongue. What I struggle with is um, I'm able to find multiple interpretations of poems because our professor does not allow looking up the re re references of the uh, poet. So how do I choose or how do I know that you know this meaning of the poem is what I will um, sort of keep. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, at some level, this question uh, responds to the belief that there is one immutable meaning of the poem. There is. The second level of the question, which often people ask me, so I'm going to like trip that and answer it is, but what if the poet did not mean this? And I've translated it differently. So here's my answer to that. I was told in, uh, in, in Trishur, and uh, unfortunately my memory is not very good anymore, so I don't remember the name of the poet, but there was a young poet, a young prodigious prodigy of a poet who wrote a poem, uh, which became very popular and which entered the syllabus. One day, this young man entered a classroom and was sitting in a class where his poem was being taught by the teacher. And the teacher interpreted the poem, and the young man put up his paw and said, that's not, the, that's not what the poem means. And the teacher said, how do you know? Right? And he said, because it's my poem. I really did that teacher, not gave that teacher. <laughs> but it is only a very young poet who would say, I wrote a poem, and therefore only I can interpret it. Once the poem is finished, once it becomes part of the great archive of humanity, it becomes a poem because people interpret it, because Vatsal has, a, has an interpretation 
that is different from Shweta's. If Vatsal and Shweta and Kriti Sundar and Nikhil and Shayanton all saw the same and read and understood the same poem, chances are it's not a poem. And we are not drawn to those poems. So here's my, uh, I will now tell you a little story and maybe read a poem, a translated poem just to answer your question. And there is, again, so um, I live in a place called Mahim in, in Mumbai, so very close to my heart, though I hated it when I was growing up because I thought it was so small. Uh, Mahim is home and I once joined a gym there, try and lose some weight. And on the next treadmill was Neela Bhagwat, who is a great classical singer. And you know what gyms are like, right? They generally have Dinchak music playing in the background to get you to move faster, or whatever they think that this percussive music will do. And one day that music system failed. And standing next to me was, or walking on the next treadmill was uh, Neela Bhagwat. And so I turned to her, Neela and said, you know, we don't have any music today. Neela, why don't you sing? Now, generally, you can't ask a classical music, musician to do that because they need their tambura and they need their this and they need their mridangam and what time of day it is and I'm not sitting down and this is not a mehfil and blah, 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 which generally translates as, you haven't paid me. <laughs> so, I'm not singing. Okay? But Neela is a socialist and so she said, okay, and she started singing. And she was singing Mungi Udali Akash. Tine Gilile Suryansh. That's a line from a Muktabai poem, 13th century. Mungi Udali Akashi means an ant flew into the sky and she swallowed the sun. And I kept thinking, and because Indian classical music allows you to look at the same line again and again, right? Because they're singing the same line again and again. So then suddenly, your mind is free to travel across an interpretative plane. So I'm thinking, Mungi Udali Akashi, an ant flew into the sky and she swallowed the sun, must be an eclipse, the black face of an ant squeezing and eating the sun. Um, and eclipses seem important in Hindu, you know. Whenever there's an eclipse, we have people who come and beg asking for money because it's good to give money when the eclipse is fading, something. Okay? Or maybe it's little Mukta Bai who's a little baby at this point, a little child, and she picks up an ant and she closes one eye and she looks up at the sun and that ant has now blotted out the sun. Physics. Maybe it's that. Or maybe it's the feeling of God. Like when you swallow God. Okay? Meltdown. Sunlight. Lava. Something happening inside you. So, at the end of this abhang that she sang next to me, we had, were both fit, we stepped off the treadmill, we were both sweating and I said, Neela, that was outstanding as always, but you know, these are, this was a wonderful song, I want to read it. Uh, and I want to read it in English because I'm lazy, I don't want to read it in Marathi. It must be translated, right? And she said, no, it's not been translated. I said, are you joking? You mean Muktabai has not been translated? What are Maharashtrians doing? So she said, no, not been translated. So I said, okay, let's, let's do this. We'll do a selection of all the Varkari women Poets of Ma Maharashtra, you select a hundred and we'll do some, like, you know, we'll choose some. And I've said this to everybody, in all the languages I know. I've said this to a Konkani poet, I've said, choose hundred Konkani poems and we'll translate them together. And we'll call this series, hundred poems you should know, Konkani. Hundred poems you should know, I told an Urdu friend, Urdu. Hundred poems you should know, Marathi, I told a Maharashtra. Hundred poems you should know, Hindi. All of them say yes. Great idea. No one comes back with any poems. Because suddenly you realize that to choose 100 poems, you maybe need to read 500 books. And then choose those poems. That's too much work. 
so they don't do it. But Neela is different, being socialist. And about three weeks later, she was at my door. She also lives in Mahim with a bunch of poems. And out of that, three years after that, because it took a while, we got the ant who swallowed the sun. And I'm going to read you a po some poems from the ant who swallowed the sun because these women are outrageous and I am totally in love. So here's Muktabai, okay? Sukhache Shevti Dukha Ale Bhetti which means after joy came, sorrow followed. The poem, as I have translated it, with Neela's help, joy and sorrow. First came joy, and on the morrow, hard on her heels, a visit from sorrow. Just as we settled down to grieving, sorrow announced that she was leaving. Joy and sorrow, what's the difference? Both are sisters, born of ignorance. Muktai tells Tsangya, self born the soul. Standing like a banyan, aloof and whole. Now, that's easy. But here is Mukta also. Mukta Bai, according to me, is the T.S. Eliot of the, of the Bhakti movement. She's really difficult to get. So, Nirgunache Dahali Parna Lavya. You know what the Nirgun is, no? Anybody? I love explaining, <laughs> like this Roman Catholic is standing here and explaining what Sagun and Nirgun is. Okay, so Vakti, uh, say, say for instance, you say, um, you, Ganpati has a, Elephant head, he has tusks, he has a big stomach. Yeah, so. Anirgun is formless. So here is the formless God that, you know, on a branch of the formless is the title of the poem. Now, hello, 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 you want to say Muktabai? It's formless, right? So how did it get a branch? She's, she smiles. Like, you go figure. I did my job, I'm the poet. Interpretation is your job. On a branch of the formless, and observe that it's a, it's a poem that sounds like a lullaby. Okay? On a branch of the formless, a cradle is tied, and Muktai's son is sleeping inside. And she's putting you to sleep. Muktai's son is sleeping inside. Sleep, sleep, little one, no words are needed. The one hand clapping can go unheeded. One hand clapping? That's a Zen koan. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Muktabai, you read some Zen? There's no sleep now, so why talk of, walking, of waking? Just this alertness, this awareness breaking. This state has no name, but it lets you see. Turn your eye inward. Now you float free. In the cradle you've spun. Jeez, is she putting God to sleep? Thus her son is God. This is God in the cradle. Her God has now become a child. But why is this surprising? Bal Krishna, baby Jesus. We make our, our gods into children to love them with the love that we can offer a child. In the cradle you've spun, now drift at your ease, rocked by the mind, still tied to the breeze. Six hours of rocking, his gaze still steady. Muktai tells Sangya, wake, listen, be ready. <laughs> and now the same, a, a lot of the other women have very, very different registers, okay? And the one register that I love very much is the fact that they can be very playful with God. Very funny, very playful with God. And here is Zanabai. 
Khanderayattula marina pakra. This is how it is sung actually, okay? Which is Khanderao, I'll kill a goat for you, okay? I'll kill you a goat. But you'll have to do something for me. Khanderaya, what if I offer you a ram? Would you be kind and slay my man? When my husband's gone, I'll guffaw and then please take my mother-in-law. When she's dead, I'll get some rest. My father-in-law, take him next. Now that death would give me bliss. My sister-in-law is next on the list. Her death would finally set me free to be with you as a varkari. Jani says, Khande, kill them one by one and let me stay by your feet alone. Give them a round of applause, my ladies from the 13th to the 17th century. Thank you. So how do I know what she means when I say, to answer your question? How do I know what she means when she says, Mungi udali akashi, tine gilile suryanshi? Which of these meanings do I say? So I choose the interpretative meaning that will allow you also to interpret. And then, in the course of this poem, she says, that wasn't the only miracle. A baron gave birth to a son. And I was so disappointed. First, that she should call women barren. Second, that it should, the miracle should be a son. So I made a, a change and I said, uh, an aged woman gave birth to a child. And then I have two filters for any translation, or at least at that time I had. One was Shanta Gokhale, who is, she's magnificent. I mean, she's like Mount Everest. So I read it to her and she said, one minute, Jerry, one minute. She's saying, Banj, how did you make that aged? I said, you know, Shanta, because I don't like the idea of like, you know. She said, it's not what you like. It's what Muktabai wanted to say. So I said, yeah, but I'll make a child. Now that's at least like, it's like, you know, at least it's a child. Any, so if, if a woman who is, has not been able to have children has a child, she'd be very happy with a girl. She said, what has she said? I said, she said, son. She said, then you say son. You don't get that choice. You don't clean them up. You present them the way they are. I don't give birth to a son. I don't. <coughs> but I don't. I hope this helps. I can only tell you from my experience. I can't tell you what to do with your work. Because learning is doing. As you do it, you learn. And then when you do it better, have one that Samuel Beckett said, failed, question mark. No matter. Fail again. Fail better. Oh! Like seriously, because almost all of art is failure. You have some idea in your head which is beautiful and tremendous and triumphant and as soon as you start putting it into words, it begins to evaporate around you. It's just, what happened? Failed. Okay, but we'll fail again, we'll fail better. Question? How much time do I have? Five Not minutes? Till one. Fifteen, twenty? Okay. We start at 10.30, no? Yeah. Okay, hello. Thank you so much for your lecture, first of all. Uh, I just want to ask how do you, sorry, I want to ask you how do you recognize a poem? Because we spoke about what is prose and when poetry in some sense is reduced to prose. But I want to ask you. Uh, okay. Uh, one of those things is that poetry is like love. Okay, Poetry is like love and love ha is anarchic. Love is uncontrollable. Love is extremely personal. Love is, uh, is the, ac the academy has tried to analyze love forever. So have you heard of your vomero nasal organ? Huh? Okay. Up in your nose, okay, about here, just cuddled behind your sinuses 
is your vomero nasal organ. It is a highly developed variant of the sense of smell. So when you smell something that attracts you, the vomero nasal organ sends a jolt of dopamine into the brain. This is the closest definition we've come to love. So, uh, and how do we know this is to be true? Because in a dental waiting room, someone did this test. They had a dental waiting room filled with chairs and on one chair, they had a drop of testosterone. Okay, highly potent. Testosterone is highly potent. If I were to take a drop of testosterone and drop it on her bare skin, she would develop facial hair within 24 hours. It's that. Because what does testosterone do? In the 14th week of the fetus's life, up to the 14th week, we are all women. All, all XY chromosome, XXY chromosome, XYY chromosome, all the variants, we are all women. 14th week, the Y chromosome, which has very little other work to do, kicks in testosterone, floods the whole of the fetus and secondary sexual characteristics of masculinity begin to appear. That's its job, testosterone. So one drop of testosterone put on a, on a dental waiting room and 85% of the cis-het women who came in went and sat on that chair. And this is, they said, the vomero nasal organ working. Working its way on with sex and with love. Come on, you think Maud Gon and W.B. Yeats fell in love that way? Don't be silly. Romeo didn't even smell Juliet. He was up there somewhere. But anyway, I'm saying, since love and poetry refuse to be defined, we all get a pass. We all are allowed to love what we want to love. It is only if you are an English literature teacher that you have to know whether this is a poem and that is not. So people often ask me, you know, Rupi Kaur, Instagram poetry, all this, is that really poetry? And I say, do you think it is? If you think it is, it is a poem. Does it work for you? Why would you ask me? I, you, any more than you would ask me, is this the man I should marry? Is this someone I should love? Dil hai ke manta nahi. The heart has its reasons that reasons does not understand. Go for it. Love the poem you love. But be prepared that when you share it, someone's going to diss it. Almost inevitably. People are mean. Chalo. Next question. Where? Where? Oh, okay. Coming. Sure. I was going to ask if I can ask two questions. One question. Okay. Uh, Choose one that you like. Okay, so uh, if you could go back to when you first started writing poetry, uh, what would you tell yourself or what would you change, if anything? Uh, you know, um, fundamentally what I believe in chaos theory. Okay. Chaos theory suggests that even the slightest change the usual uh, explanation is a butterfly flet flutters its wings in the Amazon basin and a cyclone bursts out in China. That's chaos theory. Uh, for me, if I were to change something at, of that young man who started writing poetry at age 14, I don't know what might happen, what might set in train. It is so large and so vast that I hesitate even to often other people advice. I therefore, when even on those Instagram reels that I do for Mahim Kajeri, I tell you what I've learned. And that's why I call it not advice. Hashtag not advice. Which means, hey, this worked for me. Check it out if it works for you. Doesn't work for you. Find out what works for you. That's it. So what would I tell this guy? I don't know. I don't think I'd have much to say. I didn't, I don't think I'd have... I wouldn't have noticed him. I wouldn't have talked to him. He was not very interesting. I'm now fundamentally the kind of person who only talks to interesting people or not at all. So I just look at him and think, I have another not job and walk. Huh? Yes, over there. Wait, 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 wait. Taping. Yeah, um, so 
I kept thinking back to that translator story that, that you told, right? That fa yeah, fable, yeah. yeah. So, so, it's a lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> it was very lovely. Um, yeah. So, um, I was. <laughs> no, I was thinking uh, how much of your translation work has informed your poetry writing also? Because at, at one point you said uh, re reading poetry feels like being n naked and finding meaning. And, 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 and I know, and, and I get that feeling, right? Because when you said when you write a poem for the eighth time, you, you want to ch change it, right? And, and that's like the poet, like I am working with, for, on, sorry, he's, he, he was no, notorious for that. Right? He would, yeah, he would change like two words, like after six months, something like that. So I was thinking, and so uh, then I, I, I was thinking whether for you, then translation and writing poetry both become in senses and up works of like meaning making or not? Uh, okay, I think that's a lovely question. Thank you for that. But I think uh, fundamentally everything that one does makes meaning. Okay, you have no idea how it makes meaning, but it does. So constipation might make meaning. Diarrhea might make meaning. Right? Reading certainly makes meaning. And as far as translation goes, it is the most intimate association you can have with language. Because you burrow into the text. You literally, you, 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 I often feel translators know the text they are translating much better than the writers who wrote them. Okay, because I, uh, Murder in Mahim, which I thought was a reasonably easy book, A Walk in the Park, for a translator was recently translated into, Ma into Malayalam. So the translator's name is Leo Joseph Rai, which I, I want to meet Leo Joseph Rai, I like his name. It's just like wonderful. Um, Leo Joseph Rai every day would send me questions and I suddenly realized how much Marathi, how much Hindi, how much Gujarati was in that text, folded into the text because that's how Bombay people speak. We never speak clear, concise, unadulterated English unless we have a mic and there is a camera on and we are in an air-conditioned room wearing a silk kurta that has seen better days. But kurta, there already, right? So when my, uh, when M in the Big Home was being translated into, into Spanish, the Spanish translator sent me a question, what is banyan? And I thought that's an English word. What is pig toilet? And I thought, oh, that she might not know. So I actually found a picture of a pig toilet and explained what a pig toilet is. And there was a silence from the other side. <laughs> that you would sit somewhere in a patreka box and shit, and a pig would clean it up by eating it. That's a pig toilet. Yeah. All of Goa, beautiful Goa, had pig toilets. Because the Portuguese could not be bothered to do sanitation. Why? Really? Sanitation. We have Dalits to clear the thunder boxes. You don't have to build sanitation when you've got Dalits. We are the beneficiaries of exploitation in that sense. We are the beneficiaries of a caste system that allows us to ignore the demands of sanitation. Hmm? I think we're done. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure being here. Uh, hey folks, uh, before we, I don't thank anybody. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Can we have a round of applause for ourselves for being a lovely audience actually? Come on, come on. Yes. Uh, uh, since uh, this is the last venue of our 18 city, uh, 18 college tour actually, uh, I, 
uh, I take a minute or two extra than I usually take. Uh, so uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Jino. I uh, work as an outreach coordinator for this arts and culture uh, NGO named Prakriti Foundation. Uh, we are based out of Chennai. Um, before going anywhere, so it's wonderful to be at uh, Hyderabad Central University, to be honest, because uh, when I was doing my bachelor's, uh, HCU used to be this mythical, like, legendary place where you, you should go or where you should apply. And uh, if you get in, it's the thing. So uh, when I first landed yesterday in Hyderabad, I was texting my professor, sir, I'm there. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so he was like, huh, uh, still you're not a student over there. So still, uh, <laughs> this is me everywhere. So uh, this is part of, uh, this is uh, Prakriti's uh, initiative called Poetry with Prakriti. So the idea is to bring in poets from across the world uh, to places in India, colleges in India, and take them across. We had uh, uh, poets from uh, Switzerland, France, Sweden, Netherlands, and uh, m many more uh, poets coming in. And we are tra taking them to different colleges, different spaces where they can actually read. So the reason why we are actually going into colleges is very different. Because uh, uh, in 2019, we do a bunch of poetry readings. Our average age of the audience which we had was 52. Imagine, uh, most of these guys are going to not attend our poetry readings uh, in some years. And we, and they're, yeah, okay. <laughs> and uh, it was very, uh, it was very weird in the sense that they only appreciated a certain type of poetry as uh, one of, uh, one of the audience member asked, hey, well, what do you consider poetry? The thing is that the poetry which they considered poetry was only accepted. To be honest, some of you might uh, like free verse or w whatever it is, and that was not accepted as poetry. So how can we reach to the students? So that was the idea. And uh, when we started, we just uh, came up with this very simple idea of uh, LSRW, the input and output method, where listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Most of you would have seen poetry writing workshops, but uh, how many of you read poetry is a different question altogether. Because most often, only when we read good poetry, we have the bullshit meter built onto us, and we tend to find, okay, what is a good poem? And uh, that is the exact reason why we do uh, do it. And usually, uh, we've been taking it to uh, tier three and tier four uh, colleges, and tier four, tier, tier three, and tier four colleges, and one tier one colleges, so that we feel really good that the people really understand, and we could dive into different things which we could not dive in there. And uh, since we are, uh, this is our last venue. We've been in 15 plus colleges across uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Kerala. We finished uh, uh, three three shows in ba Bangalore, and we were supposed to do one in Mysore and Manipal, but. Uh, sadly, that got cancelled, and finally, this is our last show. Uh, I'd like to just reminisce on uh, three uh, different places where we had some wonderful experiences. The first one would be uh, a college named Raja Serfoji College in Tanjavur, a, a solid tier four city, a temple city, as you would call it. We had called in the Department of English, and uh, around 40 students had come. And we figured out that when we started, in the first 15 minutes, we figured out that the students do not understand English. There was a language barrier. The Department of English, there was a Department of Tamil also was there. And uh, we had a wonderful session where we were translating what Jerry was saying to the students and the teachers. And the whole point was not about them not understanding the language, but their, uh, their intent and their, let's say, uh, very enthusiastic bunch who wanted to uh, listen to the translation of uh, what was happening. It was something like a gospel reading where one person was talking in English and another person was uh, translating in the local language. And uh, the students from the Tamil department or, uh, or the English department read out their poems very broken but beautiful in general. And that was uh, one moment where I re uh, realized that the language does not matter as much as we, the importance as we put in, does not much matter. And uh, the second one would be uh, Madurai per se, and we had around like 600 odd students from different districts who came in. Uh, fun part was we had approached certain colleges and they had said no, and when we came to this college, those students had traveled around like 150, 200 kilometers to be in this city, and it was a wonderful uh, 
thing to see and uh, finally it was a funny uh, car drive which we had from uh, our hotel to the college where we spoke jerry would you want to t- talk about that <laughs> yeah, please it was a we were it was a, a car ride in which we were trying to be it was a hollywood car chase okay. except that there was an english literature professor at the wheel so you can imagine the english literature professor driving slowly down and in front of it there is this kerala bus driver <laughs> like the kerala bus driver is straight out of bollywood like <laughs> and you're going to i was something is the the English literature department professors felt that the best place to catch a bus would be outside the bus station. <laughs> no idea why. So I said, let's go in and stand near the bus and get in. They said, no, no, the bus has to come out. And with the Kerala bus driver, he sort of stopped. So I finally just broke ranks because we chased the bus from Tamil Nadu. Yeah, we chased them for t- three districts. Three districts we chased it. <laughs> I think we, we lost that bus because at one point we caught up with him at a signal. So I went outside the bus. <laughs> okay, so he opened the door thinking, man, man, let me get out. So I got on with my suitcase and I'm turning and looking for Gino. But Gino is trying to get his suitcase out of the English literature professor's uh, car. But the English literature professor has not stopped the car. So the boot won't open. <laughs> So Jiro was shouting at him, and we were honking behind. And then this car bus stopped. The bus started and started going. So I, <laughs> so I ran up again to the bus driver and said, "Let me off the bus. I have to get off the bus." He said something in Malayalam that was so funny that the whole bus started laughing. So I said, "Just stop, okay? Laugh as much as you want, but stop this bus." So he stopped the bus, and I bowed to everybody, got off, and then we were reunited. Then we drove three districts back <laughs> to catch the bus. The next bus was. Ne- next bus. I tell you a little short story on why you should not trust an English literature professor as your getaway car driver if you are going to do a bank. Yeah, <laughs> don't. <laughs> Thank you for that. So we had uh, actually very amazing experiences across um, uh, several districts per se. So now finally coming to my foundation in general. So we are an arts and culture foundation. We have uh, multiple verticals. Uh, one of them is poetry with Prakriti. Other than that, we do uh, uh, literature, book launches, uh, 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 mental health, heritage conservation, and environment in general. So we had. Uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva recently as one of our guest speakers in Chennai, uh, giving a guest talk about different things, uh, environment that is, uh, <laughs> and uh, we also host uh, a contemporary dance award called uh, International uh, Contemporary Dance Award called uh, Pre- PECDA. It's Prakriti Excellence in Contemporary Dance Awards. It happens in Bangalore, uh, in Bangalore International Centre, where people from different parts of india and the world come and tell stories through stories through movements very simple but uh, when you see it things are very different in general uh, i'm pretty sure that most of you travel across the uh, across the country in different modes for different conferences different theater festivals or anything uh, we are having a theater festival named short and sweet south india in chennai we will be uh, hosting around like 50 plays in a span of one month every week thursday friday saturday and sunday if you are any way free or if you are dropping by there for any official activity please do drop by from 6 to 10 we'll be glad to host you and every week something or the other uh, which will definitely interest your department and you definitely will be happening drew droppers and uh, i saw a lot of people taking pictures and videos I'm, i'm pretty sure most of you would post on instagram as well please do tag us at the prakriti foundation so uh, it's my way of marketing and uh, before that i would also like to uh, 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 extend my thanks to <laughs> professor uh, ana kurian and uh, pramod sir as well as a token of our love can i please ma'am can i please come i'll just give something so that uh, all of sir please you as well sir come on can you round of applause for your professors not many times you give that come on <laughs> thanks a lot thanks a lot thanks a lot thanks a lot yeah uh 
also most of you would be uh, would be getting your phds and going to other colleges uh, to be become professors and everything uh, if you have anything related to arts or if you're a, an actor or anything related to arts please do write us at prakritifoundation@gmail.com we would be glad to see what how we can help and how we can collaborate with you so that we promote arts and culture in india in general thanks a lot for hosting us this is the last venue for the year and we'll be doing this uh, across uh, in central and north india soon so if you're anywhere there please do follow us and please do come there thanks a lot guys thanks thank you thank you so much you know and for a formal vote of thanks you have manoj kumar a phd student in the department uh, hello everyone thank you so much for coming and i would like to thank uh, jerry pinto and uh, prakriti foundation for being here and teaching talking and uh, living poetry with us and uh, teaching us that it is uh, about being in the world and what it means to do poetry in the world rather than just studying it and uh, i'd like to uh, thank uh, jerry for that and i i this is the second time it feels like deja vu i was in a uh, student in kc college in 20 i think longo so and uh, i had done this last time and uh, it was wonderful to have you then and it's wonderful to have you now yeah thanks yeah.